silhouette of her naked and unashamed, a poetic journey of faith is a revealing and inspirational journey of a young Christian woman's struggles through a life of setbacks and setups. This captivating book captures how she overcame through her faith using a jubilee of poetry followed by deep and personal messages to her readers. In this astounding book, Silhouette of Her, Naked and Unashamed, Raquel holds nothing back, sharing transparent details about how she experienced humiliation and degradation due to an uneventful booty call, to the liberation of discovering her own voice through it all. Compelling testimonies about this book include, this book is amazing, I can't put it down right now, I'm in tears too. No doubt, every woman will be met with the floodgate of emotions. From the intellectual mind of a licensed counselor and experienced motivational speaker, silhouette of her, naked and unashamed, a poetic journey of faith by Raquel R. Reed will inspire you and change your life. Order your book today at her website at www.raquelreed.com and it's also available on amazon.com. Good evening, Source Nation. I am your host, Jakeetra Bryan. I want to welcome you to Family Mix Mondays, where we are continuing and ending our series of mental health within a Black community. I really hope that you've gotten something out of this. I know I have. As a mental health clinician, as a Black woman, as a Black woman who is raising a son who is Black, then it has been very helpful and enlightening for me in so many perspectives. And it's not going to stop tonight. And I just want to encourage everyone who is watching to go out and find your local like mental health providers, talk to different people, and later I'll give you some different resources of an event that I'll be speaking at this week. That's the National Mental Health Symposium that is in Atlanta, Georgia. And so we're going to continue this series today. And I've had this guest on before, and I know she's going to continue shining light on so many areas. And we're going to focus a lot on the Black communities, different things um, centered around women and men. And so we have Raquel Reed who is a licensed therapist, speaker, author, and certified personal coach and Reiki practitioner. She's a life work specialist for more than 20 years of navigating through her own life storm. From childhood trauma, addiction, and poverty to the effects of mental illness, academic, and business success, Raquel has overcome in a celebratory fashion. Witnessing her own transformation has equipped Raquel to coach thousands in getting unstuck in the areas of both personal and professional development. Raquel uniquely takes expertise from therapy to grow and mature young your leaders. Additionally, Raquel will support your organization creating an atmosphere conducive for your leaders to grow and thrive in. She has a master's degree in professional counseling. She's licensed as a professional counselor, licensed addiction specialist, and CEO of Caterfly's Life Work, private practice. And so Raquel, I know I've read a lot about you, but girl, go ahead and tell us more about who you are and what does Raquel have going on? Well, I am in private practice full time and that private practice has also allowed me to begin something called the Organizational Wellness Program. And it is where I merge professional counseling with leadership and business development. And so I'm working with organizations on mental health in their organizations. And one of the great things that I get to do that I have to highlight here because of what tonight's topic is about is I get to work with African-American CEOs of organizations because many times these CEOs are in Caucasian dominated industries. And being in those industries, they're isolated a lot of times. Of course, you're a counselor as well, so we know that isolation is one of those things that breeds mental illness like depression and just struggling with, you know, how do I maintain who I am, who my mama raised me to be, but yet sit at the table with other people of other races who expect something different from me. And sometimes the CEOs that I'm working with are struggling with ideas that they have in their heads that may not even be perpetuated by some of their counterparts, but we're kind of trained to think this way. And so I'm, I'm really enjoying this part of the process now. And it was a program that God gave me and I really didn't understand 
that there was a term for it out there already, and it's called organizational wellness. So that's what we're doing, and I'm really focusing on African American CEOs, especially female CEOs. Oh my goodness, I still need to talk to you. That's definitely an area that I am seeing a need that God is like moving me into. And then so I'm over here trying to figure out a whole bunch of different degrees to go get in organizational leadership, PhD in leadership. But I agree. So like, you can even just start there with that. And congratulations on full time with private practice. We know, we know that that's something that is definitely a leap of faith to fully go into. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. And being a mental health therapist, you know, what I find a lot of times is people will say, well, do you ever go see a therapist? Well, if you go into full time business as an entrepreneur, I don't care what field you're in, you might want to go see a therapist because you really need support during that time. It definitely is a leap of faith. But if you don't have faith, if you're not connected to a source and you think that you're just going to get it done by yourself and you're going to have all the answers, it'll drive you stir crazy. So you definitely would need some extra support. So yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. I agree. I think like just kind of looking at that and what you're saying, like that's something that makes the stigma of what mental illness and mental health is such a hard thing. And so because whenever you climb the corporate ladder and you may have done academically well, and you may have maneuvered and, and fought past the barriers. I think sometimes people might have this notion that like, oh, I'm fine. I've done all this by myself and I don't have to go and seek any type of support. And I think that's deep rooted into the black community. And I think it starts yes, yes. like back at home with parents. I think it starts back at home with our great grandparents and the message that was sent. So how do you see that connected and kind of how can people who are up there in corporate settings or CEOs or companies work through that barrier or that thought? You know what, what I tell everyone that I come in contact with and every time I get the opportunity to be in an open forum, I always share that if you look in the Bible, there were kings and queens in the Bible and they were of great stature and they had counselors and advisors. Mm -hmm. So I tell every person that comes into my office when they sit down that they are kings and queens and I'm just their advisor, their counselor, their Good. support. I explain to them that's the reason why my office is decked out in all purple because purple is the color of royalty and that they're royalty. And I think that once we keep getting the message out, then we will ratify this whole idea and this is the other thing they just need to see us and hear our stories right right i mean raquel you've ever been to therapy yes of course i've been to therapy i've battled depression before and this is the thing you don't get to this place and you haven't had some battles of your own that you overcome and i think that that's the difference you want to relate to somebody who's been through what you've been through but what I would encourage is that you would speak to someone who's overcome. That's good. That's good. That's good. And I think like one of the things I've noticed that I, I have to teach a lot of the college students a lot is I have to help them to figure out who would be best for their season right now. And so a lot of them like, huh, I never thought about it. And I'm like, well, let's see. Based on the things that you've kind of shared with me, it sounds like you are struggling to even relate to your own race or you're struggling to even connect with the high power right now or certain things like that and then before they leave the office they really find out like man i didn't realize those things really do matter and that's what i'm saying and it does it matters like coming in and having someone who gets this journey of overcoming something in race or who gets this journey of journey and maybe you've experienced some type of racism or sexism or colorism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the messages that we also have is that it's not okay to seek someone out of the same race. Like we're being racist because we want to have someone work with us who can relate to our cultural experience. And mm -hmm. it's okay to feel like you need a woman. If you're a woman and you feel like you have to have a woman for this particular issue, that's okay. If you're African-American and feel like you need an African-American. And again, the other thing is, it doesn't mean that just because I'm African-American, we have the same culture. It really right. doesn't. Right. It means that, you know, the, the chances might increase, 
but I can have a lot of things in common with someone else of a different race. When I uh, went to therapy a couple of years ago, my therapist was Caucasian, but she was spiritual. And for me, that's what was more important at the time. Yeah, I agree. I I like what you're saying about the just being an overcomer or having someone who's gone through those things. And I think Mm -hmm. that's the start of it. Because remember culture wise, and so since we're talking about like black mental health or mental health in a black community, culture wise, we all know that it has not ever been accepted. I had a young man today who literally like the first five minutes, I had to destigmatize the young man. Because he immediately thought I was recording something. His first statement was, well, my dad said I just need to keep quiet anyway. I'm sorry, what? Like, and he had some heavy stuff. And he was like, I should just get up and leave. He kept, like, he said that. He was like, my dad said I should keep quiet anyway. And so here's this young man who's Ethiopian. So we both have the same complexion, Uh, but yet of a different culture. And so I had to break down to him different, like, things in colorism and different Mm -hmm. things in racism and prejudice because that's what he came in for. He was racially profiled. And so he was struggling with that because he was like, well, this is not a mental health issue. I'm not depressed. I'm not on drugs. Like he immediately had this thought that, well, I shouldn't be in here telling you this. I need to tell a friend instead. And the message that he got was from his dad first. Right. And that brings up the topic that everyone has mental health. We all have mental health health. So mm-hmm. our job is to manage it. Right. So for example, the thoughts and the different messages that we have, sometimes we cannot control the thought like we can't control, like I'm sitting outside right now and I can't control the mosquitoes or a bird, for example, flying over my head, right? So a thought is just like a bird. I can't control the thought necessarily that it came but what i can control is that that bird or that thought does not nest in my head Mm -hmm. it doesn't nest that it doesn't take up residence that i don't give it that permission that's what i can control so my job is simply to manage my thoughts and honestly many churches because of what the bible teaches talks about managing your thoughts But a lot of times what happens at church is that we go through this process of being so emotional that we don't hear the applicable steps that we need to take when we lead a church. Mm -hmm. And so we're not living it. There's a learn it process. There's a live it process. And then there's a lead it process. What's lead it? Lead it is when you overcome and you can help somebody else go through. Mm-hmm. I like that. I like that's good. That's so true. It is. I've had to go back and forth, even with my church, of them seeing the necessity of me being in there. Like literally, he didn't want to call it like counseling. He was just like, "Yeah, we need to get to know the gifts." And I was like, "What?" And yes, it is definitely a gift inside of me. But I was like, I wanted to be like, I think you're even struggling the, uh, with the idea of people may have mental health. <laughs> and if they struggle like, with that, then they pass it. it. Right. So I was like, that's a stigma because you can't get past the term. And of course, I know it's my gift that God has given me to like be able to hear it. And I know it goes a lot deeper than us clinically when we're in a healing. And so I, I don't take the, the credit, but I, I can tell what that was. That was all of the stigma. And the stigma, it, it does, it starts in our community, it starts in our homes. And so like, what's your suggestion on how we can kind of get people to actually uh, one, see the benefits and start taking a walk back through history and not get stuck right there because people get stuck all the time when they <laughs> trying to trace history a lot and they get mad. I think um, we just need to bring some affluent, influential people to the table who mm-hmm. are not afraid to be honest about their journey. And as more people hear, that this is normal. I mean, think about it. Every time some celebrity harms themselves, Mm -hmm. then it's put back on the forefront, but then it dies down. Again, what we need in our communities is for a continuous forum where we have leaders in the community 
who look like us, who we hang out with, we need them to really get out and, and help to spread the message. And one of the things that I've been doing, because I'm not a celebrity, I'm not even a local celebrity, but I've been getting out in the community and going to even events like the mayor's clergy meeting that they have once a month. So I think next week that meeting happens again and it'll be my second time going. And what I've been doing is sharing with the clergy community that there is a stigma that many mm -hmm. of them even hold and that if they could release that and allow me to maybe even work with them and help them, mm -hmm. then we can start releasing that in the community. Invite me to your church. Let me come and speak and let me come and share. Um, because a lot of times people are going to them and there's only, it's only so far that they can take them. We need both. We need the spiritual component, but we also need applicable tools to use. Yeah. And it's not saying that one outweighs the next. We need them both. Right. We need them both. And I think that's a stigma in itself. I'm with you. Counselors were very present in the Bible. And I've had to do the same thing you did and break down that to people in sessions. I remember one time, it offended me when I, I'm not, I don't even talk to that girl now, but she would call me like bad boundaries on my part, but call me like every day about her divorce. And for like a year, literally like before I went to work for being a therapist. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And when she finished, like, I remember at the end, she was like, you're right, I do need a therapist, because I kept on suggesting it. She was like, but I think I want a Christian therapist. And I remember getting so offended, not because she said she wanted a Christian therapist, but because I am a Christian woman, and every day she had been calling me. And she, it was like she just dismissed, like, that journey, and immediately was like, oh, only somebody now inside the church, versus somebody who has the same faith, who also can give you practical things and dismiss mm -hmm. the fact that I was giving her practical things already to do. Mm -hmm. So I was just like, wow, that's just really the thought process of a person um, as to mm -hmm. like who they view can help. But you're right, that can get past a certain point and they don't have any applicable or the thought process and theories that we can hear that can actually get to the other root of some stuff. Yeah, I know a couple of weeks ago in working with one young lady who happens to be one of the CEOs that I work with, she said, you know, what I really love about this process with you is that you hear what I say, but you also hear what I don't say. And mm. I think that's the clinical piece is mm -hmm. that we're trained also to hear what they don't say. And we can be a benefit to the community, to the body of Christ, to businesses. We can be such a benefit to so many yeah, people if they would change their mindset about it. I liken it to getting a massage. If you go get a massage to relieve tension, um, it's a beautiful process, you know, and the process of therapy is the same thing. I love to have fun with the people. Yeah. I don't like to say my clients, but the people that I serve, I like to have fun with them and show them that therapy doesn't always have to be arduous, but also give a lot of homework too, because um, the process takes place outside of that one hour that you come to yeah. see them. This is your journey and it's your work. I'm just beside you, supporting you, but you have to do your work. Yep. I, I hope we really do get past the stigma. And I know that it definitely starts in conversations at home. Like, it's just like messages upon messages that's got embedded in people's head, but they've been very false messages that have, to me, left people paranoid. Unnecessary paranoia that you can't trust people. And mm -hmm. you don't even know why. <laughs> like, it's just like, you can't trust the black man. You can't trust the therapist. They're going to go tell your business. We're the most sworn and secrecy people in the world. <laughs> like, Honestly. And that should be a comfort in coming to us for everyone that's listening, that we are paid professionals. But what you want to find is a paid professional who's also a loving professional. But we're paid professionals who have a license. And because of that license, if we were to inappropriately share your information, then we could lose our livelihood. We're not just talking, you know, I'm talking about what I do every single day, and I'm not going to risk that to gossip about what's going on with you. Mm -hmm. No, and pl plus, we hear a lot. <laughs> we so do. It's, so it's almost like, I don't know what story we're we going to choose. <laughs> and if we're really going to go that route of being like, well, let me choose that one of all the thousands of stories. <laughs>
Yes. <laughs> Over these years. And that's what's special about the process too, is that for the clergy that are listening and family members that are listening, they also need to know that that's why it's great to have a conversation with somebody about getting professional help because a lot of times that family member when they're sharing with you what they're going through they're dumping a whole lot on you and you may not have the capacity to hold what they're even sharing with you you don't know what to do you don't know what to say and so the best thing to really say is to ask them have they ever thought about getting support you could say have you ever thought about seeking professional help you could even say have you ever thought of getting a professional friend mm -hmm. it's a yep. good way to break the ice and and lead them to somebody who's yeah. caring and yeah. and that can help right because i like that's something i found so let's look at like some because i know um like you made a really really good point like about the culture like we can be black and but not of the same culture side and i think that a lot of people don't understand that and so and because of that like i know that being at georgia state is a very diverse campus and i've experienced several people who are of different cultures that might have the same skin complexion or lighter or darker um, fair, mm -hmm. but they don't have the same culture of me. Mm -hmm. And so like, how can parents break down the barrier that may have been set culture wise, if they are from cultures that does not accept women as someone that you can go to for help? Well, this is the thing, honestly, if if seeing a woman for that person is such a barrier, I honestly wouldn't even recommend that they do that because you have such a different focus of why you're going to therapy. So you don't want to put another barrier in the way that actually hinders it. Uh, but I will say this, I have worked with men who I realized would benefit from working with a woman. And I want to illuminate that just a little bit because these are men generally who have issues with women mm -hmm. I, many times especially if the issue was with their mother many times if they can find a, a caring professional that professional really can help them walk through it and sometimes but sometimes it really is beneficial for them to work with a woman so they just have to think about that and decide if they can push past that barrier and go in because otherwise they would be struggling back and forth you know even down to arguments and things like that and i think there are times where you may not agree with your therapist but if you walked into it already not wanting to hear that person because of their gender their race what side of town they lived on because again when you go back to culture i live right here and at that house that could be a black family that's set up exactly like my family meaning a husband a wife a mom and a dog okay mm -hmm. but we're two different cultures and two different households even in the same neighborhood so there's so many things that causes culture to change culture changes from house to house mm -hmm. from community to community so what you're looking for is someone who is to some extent relatable Mm -hmm. So if skin color matters to you, just know that because that person's skin is the same color as yours does not mean that they have the same experience as you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's really important, especially when it comes to understanding mental health, because the person might be coming in there talking about something in forms of colorism or in the form of background experiences and needing someone to relate and i think it helps um to stop kind of creating um this reasoning as to why i, I don't ask nobody for help it's secondary to why i don't go to church that's why i don't ask nobody for, <laughs> to do that that's why i don't go to church yeah and you know we deal with messages a lot i mean i, I think every single session jakeetha we have to talk to people and uncover the tapes that are in their head mm -hmm. you know there are certain groups that each therapist works better with, honestly. And we know what that group is. So I think it's back on us that when people come to us that we don't take on people that we really are not equipped to help. So given that soft and gentle referral 
to somebody else who might be a better fit for that person. I do that all the time with people because I don't want to take on somebody that I really am not the best fit to support them. And then there are times where someone comes in and you, you don't realize that you really are the best fit. And that's hopefully that's your humility that says, you know, I'm not everything to everybody. So I'm not offended if somebody even fires me. I've been fired before, Jaquitha. Have you ever been fired <laughs> by a person you serve? Yeah, one girl, she's, it was so weird. That girl had had so many people and I wasn't even like offended with her. I was her second therapist and I sat her down one day and I said, well, what is it that you're looking for? Well, that's what they, I don't know. I go, you're going to have to figure that out. It's not you don't like anybody. We're all going to be out of here and you're going to be looking like it's them. And I was like, when it's really like, I, yeah. I was like, you got you to gotta do a portion of work yourself. And so she was, that's I, right. If I'm doing all the work, then this is not going to work. Yeah. And we have to be stern with them about that. But even currently now, with some of my clients who get, uh, I guess you could say somewhat lackadaisical in sessions, I have a form that I send them that they have to use to prepare themselves for the session. And it starts off simply with what do I want to talk about today? And that form has to be filled out before they come. That's a good idea. Yeah, I have one client that like, she's a tough one <laughs> and I would put her in a group, but one of her barriers is I had to take a step back because I like high functioning people who ready to go. That's just me, but I know it ain't always everybody and I need to watch that. But like, I do have one particular person and then part of her deep rooted issue is in fact that no one ever stopped to ask her what she needed. So I oh. realized that I'm working past a deeper barrier. So I was like, okay, Chitra. This may be a moment for you to actually really, really empower her voice. Instead oh, of, yes. But like, that's a beautiful question. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful thing to be able to sit down and realize that that's one of my issues. Is yep. Because that happens to so many people. And, and we have to constantly ask that question. What is it that you need right now? But you know, when we ask that, you know, a lot of times, People don't know because they haven't been asked. So we have to cultivate that environment for them to be able to, okay, you might have to leave and think about that and come back yeah. next week. And maybe you get it by next week. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times people want to shortcut this process, but it's a journey. And that's why I love the word growth over goals because yeah. goals are short term. they like, okay, or you can have a long-term goal, but the point is that it has an end date right right whereas growing does not have an end date all of us need to grow and i always tell people it's the one thing that god requires of you he doesn't want you to stay in the same place all the time no, mm, no goodness no but even in our human anatomy anything that you watch grow that's living does not stay in the same physical state so no. mentally and spiritually we must grow as well Mm -hmm. I have to put that in terms of a lot of people all the time and it's something really interesting and I think that goes back to like the rooted um, part of it there's a mm -hmm. lot of focus within the black community unfortunately and I just I'm going to use black community as a whole and not mm -hmm. necessarily different cultures but there's a lot of emphasis on like making sure that like the finances are in order that making sure that everything as far as financial needs are met that it, there's a heavy emphasis within the black culture to me on that and there's the dismissal of the emotional and the um, mental needs of a person I think that's where there's an issue when it comes to like being like asking somebody how's your day and having engaging conversations that have emotions involved in it I was wondering from your experience do you feel like the black community is more about what you do for a living versus how are you today Right. Yeah, I do. And I think it, and I think I there's like a misinterpretation that. of even scripture. I think people take it and they're just like, oh, this one right here. This one fits me. I need to go ahead. He said, if I don't work, I don't eat. <laughs> and that's all. And they forgot that God even mentions the emotions about fruit, the fruit that you bear. Half of those are emotions. Mm -hmm. Actually, most of them are emotions, actually. <laughs> and so they're a type of experience that you're going to feel with some intense emotions. And I think that people just kind of take it and they run and they forget. 
and they neglect the emotional needs and the mental mm-hmm. needs of a person that's right in your own house. Yeah. And I, I personally believe it leads to divorce. And I believe it leads to um, people running away from their families and never turning back around. I think there's a disconnect. You know, um, people are living in the same house, their roommates. I mean, there's just a disconnect. Yeah. I think we also, in the community at large, just have a habit of saying, how you doing? I remember the last um, J-O-B that I had, and I hope I never have to go back, and I don't believe I will, but the last J-O-B that I had, uh, you would be sitting in your office, and somebody would walk by and say, good morning, how you doing? But they're still going. They don't stop, and I think even with social media, I think sometimes it's just causing such a great divide and disconnect Mm -hmm. with us, and I think that People need to be more conscientious about how they use their social media. What does your page say about you? Uh, Do you go on your page? Because many, many people that are stigmatized by mental health actually use their social media websites to deal with their mental health issues. You, you, you are, you are blasting people on there that you otherwise um, are afraid to uh, say in front of their face how you really feel. So you go on social media, you vent, right? I mean, it's just so many different ways that people go on social media and deal with their crises instead of getting professional help. And if you're concerned about what people think about you, then I would say this is the time to be concerned because people are looking at your page saying this person needs some real professional support what is your social media saying about you go back and look at it yep i know i've read a few things and i I have to keep myself off the soapbox and after not saying things to people because i am the professional i'm not about to get them started inboxing me and i have to then shut it down and be like well you can come to services and we can complete this conversation, especially mm-hmm. if I'm not open for any um, additional people. So like, that's something. But when I read pages like that too, I'm just like, oh goodness, this person definitely, they done had about five divorces. They done went through this. Now they on here and they're going off about this person. And I, that reminds me, I remember um, on Facebook, there was a young lady. I haven't spoken to her in like years and she had gone through a divorce. And I only know this because her Facebook page let us all know. Right, right. In it, I said something to her through the inbox, and I said it as a Christian woman. I made sure I said it like that. I'm coming to you as a Christian woman, not, not as a therapist, because I knew where that was going to go. Mm-hmm. And I remember I said to her, I use my therapeutic things, and I use it my compassion as a woman, but I said, going through a divorce can be really, really hard, and I know that you're hurt. Like, you didn't walk into the marriage thinking, and 10 years later, he was going to be cheating, and you were going to be divorced, and you were going to be angry. And I said, so you have a right to have every single emotion that's coming through. But right. please take it off of Facebook and actually take the time now to go and heal and work through it. Because I was like, everything you're saying is valid. You got every right to kick and scream and to be upset. And I was like, but if you really want true healing, this is the time to go process it with somebody and step off and talk to someone else about it. Yes. And she ended up like saying, you're right, you're right. And I didn't post nothing else like that yet, like since. Actually, matter of fact, the other day I, I saw she said she had a house warming. So she had, actually has moved forward and has now purchased a house of her own with her kids, aside from with that divorce. And I was like, see, yo, yeah. Because our Facebook folks was like, girl, get them. That rat, you know how they do. But I think the other thing that that brings up is interesting because you were talking about the focus on finances, but yet when it comes to mental health, people also don't want to use their finances to invest in mental no. health. And, oh my goodness, no. and so it's kind of a, it's kind of an oxymoron that they will be so focused on their finances in their home, but yet we don't think about investing. And I, I just had this conversation with somebody the other day. Mm-hmm. One of the things that we have to begin to do is stop thinking about what something costs us and think about what something is going to pay us. Mm -hmm. So when you invest in therapy, what is paying you is exactly what you shared. And that young lady's story is the ability to move forward Mm -hmm. and freeing you up to your healing. You deserve, you deserve the healing 
just as well as you deserve to be angry. But if you if you uh, cash in, you deserve to be angry, then you stay stuck. So we, we got to look at our cost benefit analysis. <laughs> yep, and take that a step further. There is a cost, but there is a there is a cost because you now are costing yourself stability and peace. And I break that peace down a minute in sessions, <laughs> like what peace really is. And mm -hmm. it's costing the insecurity. It's costing your confidence. It's costing your value. It's costing those things when you neglect other areas. Hopefully our families will definitely, definitely see benefit and see that it starts like within. And that, those are messages. And I'm not sure what age group. Do you work with um, adolescents and teens? I prefer to work with adults at this point. And um, I used to work with children primarily. However, when I made the switch to working in a detox facility, I was with adults. And I had to, I had to use the skills that I use with other people in therapy. And I had to reframe the whole idea because I was actually somewhat uh, fearful or I actually say, because people don't think I ever get intimidated, but I do. I was actually intimidated by working with adults because you know, they're on a different level. They can call you out about certain things too, right? But what, I did, but what I did was I decided to reframe my idea about it because I really loved working with children and connection there with um, making sure that other children were protected. And so what I thought about was this, I said, well, if you're working with adults who are addicted to drugs and alcohol, if you're, if you're effective at what you're doing, you know, you're helping children by bringing their parents back to them. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know what, and I'm so glad you said that because that's what I was leading to her. I wanted to talk about the fact that we model, like we keep the cycle going. We either stop it or we keep it going. And you're right. I wanted parents to recognize that they're modeling every time they're quiet, every time they only go to work and they shut their mental state off, their emotional state. That's exactly what you're producing. You, mm -hmm. That's what you sow. <laughs> that's what you shall reap. It's mm -hmm. not only money. And many times, you know, the parents haven't had the tools that they needed when they were children. So mm -hmm. it's really beneficial to go to therapy and maybe even begin on your own, but to bring your children sometimes into yeah. those sessions so that the family can heal together, so that you're in a supportive environment to help you have those tough sometimes conversations that we have to have with our yeah. families. But I know even me personally, when I have a tough conversation with my spouse, I love the other side of it. Like it's that getting through. And then when you get to the other side, it just feels so good. And I think a lot of people are chasing a feeling today and that's unfortunate, but there is a validating and positive and a good feeling that we can have. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it comes after we push through some of the pain. Yeah, it is. That is so true. I know it's it's something when you, you marry or date a therapist. And so if you're not in touch with some of your emotions, you're going to be toward the end of this. <laughs> we, that is one thing we will hold you accountable for, <laughs> is having those emotions and, and making them known. <laughs> so I, I, I think that's something. Well, definitely, this has been super helpful. And um, I really do hope with this series, with mental health awareness, that we are at least kicking off the stigma that's centered around people's head. And I don't know how far we have to go, but I believe as long as we keep talking and we're not silent, then I believe we're moving. Definitely. So, so thank you for providing the platform, you and Source Nation. And um, because I don't think a lot of platforms allow for just a candid talk about um, the stigma there. So you guys are doing a great work in providing that. And any way that I can be of help, I would, ooh, you in Georgia too. I would love to come to Georgia. Let me know about the events there. And yes, I have a sister that lives in Douglasville. Okay, yeah, we yeah. go to Douglasville every Sunday. <laughs> but it's everywhere. I mean, so everyone has mental health. Yeah, yeah. So just remember that. And yeah. it's okay so to ask for help. It definitely is. They, they need to. I remember like in the relationship that I'm in, we started talking and maybe like in October, 
he was just like, come on, I like talking to you. We get somewhere. <laughs> he was like, he was excited. And I think we were arguing. And, I, and so the facial expression I had was like, <laughs> and so, but he was like, no, we really get somewhere. We solve a problem. He was so like, I've never experienced it. Right. So he was so excited because he had saw so many benefits to us actually engaging in conversation that mm -hmm. he had never experienced in his family nor mm -hmm. experienced in his last marriage. So mm -hmm. I, I think that's something that speaks volumes and that's that's coming from a black man that did not share the same culture was raised in new orleans i'm raised in alabama that's two different cultures raised mm -hmm. in the church background i was too but family line of pastors that's a different culture and mm -hmm. so those were things that we had to discuss even though we shared the same complexion mm -hmm. and so those things make a difference with communication mm -hmm. i think that also brings up many of the different reasons why someone might want to seek out therapy. And I think we probably should cover those really quick too. You're in a new relationship. You've been divorced. You're going through a divorce. You're having trouble with your child. Your child has ADD, ADHD. You get a new diagnosis. Someone in your family or close to you is struggling and it's impacting you. Uh, a house burnt down. It's so many reasons why someone might come seek out therapy. Think about it this way. What in my life right now do I need support with? If it is a past issue or an, a current issue that still has its roots in a past issue, okay? Meaning, you know, you know because you're triggered by it all the time. That is a reason to go to therapy. But if you are like a business person or in a personal situation, but you're present, but you're just having trouble moving forward, that's a coaching situation. So what type of support do I need? You need to know that. And I wanted to say that too, Jaquitra, because a lot of times when people uh, contact me, they are not sure whether they need coaching or therapy. So I think we need to start doing that as well, because what happens sometimes is they'll go to a coach who is not ethical because, you know, they're just certified or some of them don't go to school or get anything and they're just calling themselves a coach. So you need to really research who you're using, whether it's a coach or a therapist. But many of these coaches are taking people on who need to be in therapy. Yep, I agree. I agree. That's good. That's good. I'm glad you mentioned that. You're right. Um, because I think people people think that you only come into therapy if mm -hmm. you hear voices. I ain't got nobody who heard voices, to be honest, about five, six years. Right. That's right. actually not the average. Yeah, that's good because it's just really life's challenges, life's yeah. ups and downs. And sometimes your family members may not have the capacity to help you. Your pastor may have reached his limit on where he can help you. Now, can he continue to pray for you and support you in other ways? Yes. But at some point, in addition to that support, you need professional help. Yep, I agree. And, and just make sure you, you look at the credentials of the professional that you're working with. And honestly, we joked about being fired earlier, but if you go to your therapist and after the first three visits, you should know whether that therapist is the right fit for you. And it doesn't mean that you just like them. It means that this is a person who's honest with you, who challenges you, and who has good boundaries. And also, and I should have said this first, you want a therapist who has wisdom. So if after those first three sessions, you don't see those qualities, fire them and get you somebody who works well for you. Yeah, it's okay. it sure is. I have to tell people that all the time because you know, they like us to do consults. And in our consults, like we can see like who they've had. And I was talking to a young lady earlier and she was just like, I said, oh, I can see you've been here before. Would you like your same mm -hmm. person? She's still here. She was like, no, she says, I like her. <laughs> and, so, and I could tell their hesitation that they feel bad by even mm -hmm. saying that something just didn't hit on it. And I have to let them know, mm -hmm. y'all, it's okay. <laughs> like, it's okay. I was like, and if it offends the therapist, that needs to go work on that part about them. That's not even your That's stuff. Right. They say stuff, and they get offended. And I was like, so you just advocate for yourself <laughs> as to what you're needing during the season. That's right. But they feel so mm -hmm. bad. I'm just like, girl, uh-uh. Everybody mm -hmm. work with everybody. <laughs> so be okay. <laughs> be okay. 
But where can they get in touch with you? I'm not sure if you are accepting any clients, but just whatever information that you have. I think on the screen, if they're watching, it says RaquelReed.com. And so they can go there uh, to get lots of information. Psychology Today is another great place to find more text or content about me so that you can see if I would be the right fit for you. And the great thing about therapy is that, you know, well, I'm here in North Carolina, so I will work with people in the immediate area or pretty much so. But if it was a a coaching situation, I can work with people all over the United States and outside of the United States. So if you are interested, you can still go to RaquelReed.com. The other thing that you can do is call 336-355. 7237. And I do a lot of different things. Like right now here in Fayetteville, I'm also doing a a mastermind group. We're planning on a The Silhouette of Her retreat, um, which is a celebration of my book, but also a celebration of every woman that chooses to go through that journey with me. Uh, And then next year, hopefully, we'll be doing a marriage retreat with a young man who I have um, connected with who's African-American. So we want really about marriages and building uh, healthy marriages because if we can continue to build healthy marriages, we build healthy communities and we have healthy, beautiful children. Yes, I agree. Hopefully I'll be married very, very soon and I will come to that retreat because I'm all about (laughs) therapy and retreat. (laughs) Oh, yes. I am an advocate, a product of therapy, all the above, the, all mm-hmm. of them. Like everybody. And, I'll, and let your viewers know too that they can go to Amazon.com mm-hmm. for my book, Silhouette of Her Naked and Unashamed. I love that title. I love that. And I'm so glad that you joined me today. And so, like, Source Nation, definitely, definitely, like, tune in to Raquel and reach back out to her with any questions or comments or just talk. Sometimes just start with a conversation and you'll see that we are truly real people. Like, we are real. (laughs) We are overcomers. I love that you said that. And so I want to mention this event. Um, It is called the National Mental Health Symposium and Community Symposium. And it is on Wednesday the 29th from 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Unity Atlanta Church, 3597 Parkway Lane, Norcross, Georgia. Um, that is Wednesday the 29th from 7 to 5. It's Unity Atlanta Church. And so um, Evite will be on my website. So you can find me on social media at Jahitra Bryan. Also, I'll tweet it out. And so definitely be a part. It is an open community event where you can just come and get other professionals professionals who are in the mental health field about it, um, concerns that are real life when it comes to mental health, even down to millennials and dating. I saw that on there. And I'll be talking about different accessibility to resources. So I'm pretty yeah. good at just trying to get you to come, just come and talk. <laughs> like that is my area. I believe one thing God has called me to do is to bring community together and bring people together. So I thought that was a really interesting topic that I end up getting that I didn't pick. So I was like, huh, okay, we're gonna roll with it because that's that's what I do anyway. <laughs> I, I bring the community together. So mm-hmm. that makes a lot of sense. And so definitely um if you're in the Atlanta area, come to that on Wednesday. I can also be found at JA Bryant1913 at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter at Jakitra B uh, website www.b3mentalperformances.com. And just continue to tune back in as we keep going with breaking the stigma and breaking cycles when it comes to the families and when it comes to the communities and just empowering and lifting up each other and redefining what like this whole family unit looks like. And so tune back in at Source Radio Network. Silhouette of Her, Naked and Unashamed, a poetic journey of faith, is a revealing and inspirational journey of a young Christian woman's struggles through a life of setbacks and setups. This captivating book captures how she overcame through her faith, using a jubilee of poetry, followed by deep and personal messages to her readers. In this astounding book, Silhouette of Her, Naked and Unashamed, Raquel holds nothing back, sharing transparent details about how she experienced humiliation and degradation due to an uneventful booty call, to the liberation of discovering her own voice through it all. Compelling testimonies about this book include, this book is amazing, I can't put it down right now, I'm in tears too. No doubt, every woman will be met with the floodgate of emotions. 
From the intellectual mind of a licensed counselor and experienced motivational speaker, silhouette of her, naked and unashamed, a poetic journey of faith by Raquel R. Reed will inspire you and change your life. Order your book today at her website at www.raquelreed.com and it's also available on Amazon.com. Yo! Yeah.